Hello, and welcome to the Black and Dyslexic Podcast with Winifred A. Winston and Lederic Horn, the show that unapologetically focuses on helping Black and underrepresented minorities navigate the special education process. We want to help raise awareness in the Black and Brown community, remove the stigma about learning disabilities, and provide you access to professionals in the space of dyslexia and special education that you need to hear from. Hey, everybody, this is Ladera Horn here. I'm here with Winifred. Hey, Winifred. Hey, Ladera. So you're getting ready to hear an interview that Winifred did with O.T. Warren. The third. And O.T. Warren, the third. That's right. And uh, <laughs> and we don't want to forget the third because I think uh, you'll hear as part of his story is not only being a person with dyslexia, is that he's also a part of a, a very proud family of entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things. Um, and there were a few things in listening to this interview that stood out to me. Number one is that OT just felt, he felt like someone I grew up with, right? Like, I think it's one of the, the interesting things about the uh, dyslexic experience and the experience of people who have passed through, you know, special education or some form of special education is that many of us have very similar experiences. You know, it felt like if him and I were in a room together, we would just have to, you know, have a very brief conversation and we'd be real, real fast friends. Um, the other thing is that he talks about mainstreaming and his experience being mainstreaming as a young person. And, and that was, uh, again, familiar. And I would also say maybe a bit triggering for me because I remember, you know, being classified in the third grade and, and having, you know, a special education teacher that was just a champion of mine who was slowly trying to push me, you know, out into, into regular classes. But it was very much just sort of being dropped in uh, to, a, to a classroom surrounded by people I didn't know and not having the supports that I really needed to be successful. And that mainstreaming, I think, is important because um, I am a champion of inclusion and inclusive practices and making sure that not all, not only are all of us in the same room together, but we're also getting the supports we need to be successful. And that's uh, both the students and the, and the staff of the school. And so, yeah, the, just hearing him talk about that throughout his journey, you know, just brought that up to me and, and, you know, it was something to listen to as you guys experience this this conversation. I just want to add, I mentioned very often in the podcast uh, that he was one of the first people, Black people that I, I met that like steered me in the right direction. And we talk about community. We talk about networking a lot on this podcast. And I met OT because he was referred to me by another Black woman who I met at work. I was doing work and I had to go visit a, a CBO, community-based organization, and me and this young lady were talking, and at the end of our meeting, we're wrapping up, and somehow, I don't know how, we got on the topic of my daughter being dyslexic and her nephew having some challenges, right? And so she just said to me, oh, well, you need to meet OT. I can right. make that connection, right? right? And, and so, you know, this is uh, just another example of sharing, being okay to share, and talk about these topics, right? These taboo topics to other people of color. Yeah, and, and OT is a great example of just the, the confidence, right? The confidence of someone who has embraced the identity of being dyslexic and you don't, you don't hear any shame in his voice, right? He's, he's coming from a place of, of empowerment. And I hope that this, this conversation empowers you. So uh, without any more to do, here is the interview that Winifred had with OT. Today, we have O.T. Warren with us. O.T. is the president of O.T. Warren Management. I'm so excited to have him today. Welcome, O.T. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. And I just want to thank you for, you know, inviting me to be on this podcast. And I was going to give thanks to you for being such an advocate for um, Black dyslexics. Thank you, O.T. Thank you. So again, I want to want to thank you for, you know, being so passionate about this subject and um, being a parent advocating for your child that's dyslexic. And, you know, you, and you, I don't believe that you're dyslexic. So that really means a lot to, you know, to me, dyslexics, that you're jumping out there and you're really fighting for, for us. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, OT. But enough about me. I want you to share with the audience your story. I find it amazing. And it was one of the first, again, you were like the first person I talked to who had a positive experience and your parent knew how to get you help. Everyone else I spoke to either didn't know what dyslexia was, hadn't heard of dyslexia. But when I talked to you, 
you were like, no, this happened, this happened, my dad did this. So tell us about your journey. Yeah, well, um, I got diagnosed with dyslexia when I was in the fifth grade at Roland Park Public School. And uh, my father was really a bit big advocate for me um, because he was also dyslexic. So he saw, he knew that I needed additional help once it was identified. So from first to fifth grade in, uh, at Roland Park, I didn't really struggle as much, but I was also, I was part of the Learning Resource Center uh, at Roland Park. Like I was mainstreamed into class, but I would always have a period where I would go to the Learning Resource Center. And, you know, that was a, always a fun class for me, you know, enjoyed the, the kids there, the friendships you made, special friends just being in the Learning Resource Center. And um, a teacher, I remember her name, her, her name was Miss Slow. She was really, really nice. I think about that now as I get older, I was like, wow, the learning resource teacher, her name was Miss Slow. I was like, I was like, oh. now, that, now, that I, now that I think about it, I was like, you know, wow. But, um, you know, for kids who learn, learn a little bit differently, you know, I, I never, I didn't think about that when I was young, but I think about that now. I was like, I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of ironic. I was like, of course we, you know, we're not slow. We just learn differently. But um, that was always a, uh, something that I enjoyed going to the Learning Resource Center. And um, after fifth grade, I was uh, mainstreamed into the middle school. And uh, that's when things kind of got a little bit tougher because I didn't have that Learning Resource Center to go into. Like they just kind of just mainstreamed me. I was in sixth grade and that's when, you know, I started struggling. I started getting like deficiencies in class and um, my father knew that I needed some help. So um, that's when I got tested. A psychologist, I remember his name was um, Dr. Arterbein. I'm not sure if he's still around, but um, he tested me and I um, tested for you know, dyslexia, I don't really, I remember the going testing and having to move around blocks. And he, I think my reasoning skills were very high. You know, I do remember that he was like, how did, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? I was just like, I don't know. It's like this game that they, you move around blocks and, and things like that. And they also did some reading comprehension with me. And um, that's when it was diagnosed that I was dyslexic. And so at that time, my, my father was trying to figure out, hey, what, you know, what do I do? And, you know, I was struggling. I was struggling in class. I was, you know, I was not, not, not necessarily a bad kid, but I was getting deficiencies with everything checked off, like behavior wise and certain classes. And um, he was just trying to figure it out. And it was actually pretty depressing for him. He, I remember him telling me as I got older and he wanted to get me into a school called Jemisee. And uh, I was in I was in the sixth grade. And um, I remember going to visit a school and it was, it was a little bit different. You know, I was, Rolling Park was kind of a mixed school. Um, I had black kids and white kids in my class, but you know, Jimacy, it was mainly a majority white students. So during that time, you know, I was still at Rolling Park and I guess the hiccup was I couldn't get into Jimacy. Mm -hmm. You know, I tested well, Jimacy doesn't accept just any student. You have to have like a certain IQ score to get in and I tell, you know, I tested well and my father had the money to get me in, but for some reason there was a block. They didn't let me in. So he was trying to figure it out and um, he just really didn't know what to do until one day he was, I think he was coming from a board meeting and he saw someone in the elevator who was asking, hey Otis, um, what, what's going on? You don't look well. And he, he was talking about, he's like, my son's not doing well in school. And, you know, she explain like, hey, what's the problem? And he said, I'm trying to get him into the school and, you know, they're not, they're not letting him in, you know, he's, he's tested well and, you know, it's still, I don't, I don't understand. So um, the next day he got a call that your son can go to Jimacy. All oh, right. Yeah. So um, I was immediately transferred, you know, it was kind of like a OT, you, you going to a new school, you know, I was leaving Rolling Park and I was just like, okay, I, I, as a kid, I kind of, you know, I just adapted, you know, I didn't, I didn't really fight it or anything like that. So I ended up going to um, Jimacy. I was in sixth grade at the time, but they put me back a grade when I transferred in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Jimacy, they, they kind of have, they don't go fifth grade, sixth grade, they go by letters. So I think at that time I was in star group. 
So I started in Star Group midway in. And it was, you know, it was different going to that school. You know, I was, again, I was the only black kid in the school and, and not in the school, but in my class. So I kind of had to adapt to that and adapt to the style, the learning style that they, I would have a tutor, mainly small classes. And one thing that I really remember that was different is we called the teachers by their first name. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, can, I was like, wow, I can, I can just call you by your first name. Like that was, that had, I had to get used to that. No, it was, it was, it was a good, good experience. You know, they kind of, I'm just trying to, you know, thinking back at it, you know, I was just kind of going through it as a, I guess I was 12 at the time. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think back to how they helped me with my learning difference. And it was, I think it was a lot with the smaller classroom sizes and um, basically just having, they paid a lot of attention to me individually. It was, you know, I had an individual tutor and it was a good experience. So yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's very different. My daughter is at Gemma. She, and she's going to star group because she's going to sixth grade. Okay. And, and what I learned um, as director of admissions of another private school is when my daughter was identified, I immediately thought, oh, we have, okay. When I learned about private dyslexia schools, because I had never heard of them. I didn't even know they existed, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know Jimacy, Odyssey, the lab school. Um, these are schools here in Baltimore. I didn't even know they existed. And I passed the lab school all the time driving to work, right? right? Um, I knew about the Green Spring area from when I worked in sales, but I just never knew about these schools, right? Mm -hmm. Someone said, oh, you need to get her into a private dyslexia school. I'm like, they have those? Like, I didn't know. Right. And what I realized after being director of admissions of, of one of the schools is that I thought as a parent, okay, she has dyslexia, she's just going to get into this school. But because so many students are behind and a lot of parents don't get them identified until later, even the private schools have a hard time accepting kiddos because they group you by your, your academic level. So they're looking for a certain profile. For example, I was helping a parent and her daughter is about to enter high school, but she has been fighting the whole time and her daughter hasn't been remediated. Her math is like on an elementary level, like second, third grade. Mm -hmm. So she's having a hard time getting accepted to a school because there's no peer group for that. They're right. going to be at least at middle school math, right? If they're behind. Right. So, so I didn't know that. I just thought my daughter is dyslexic. She's going to get into this school. Right. right? And, and that's not the case. They're looking for a certain profile and then they have a number cap because they want to keep it small and they want to be able to have that individual help and, and really get to know the child. So it was all these other factors that I just didn't know about. Right. right? And, and like I tell folks, if you're doing tutoring, if you're doing outside tutoring, let the school know because that can make all the difference. Right. right? I didn't know when my daughter toured the school. I thought, you know, I said, oh, she's touring to see if she likes it. Her dad was like, no, they're evaluating her. I'm like, right. what? He was like, they're seeing if she's going to be a good fit, what group she would match with, you know, and we, we toured, we, me and her dad toured two schools, but then she did what they call shadow days at two, you know, two different schools. So mm -hmm. there was a lot I didn't know about that process of, of how do you get in? I just figured she's dyslexic. It's a dyslexia school. She's going to get in. But see, one mm -hmm. thing you pointed out was that your dad had a friend. He knew someone. You know, mm -hmm. he knew someone and he shared that with them. Hey, I'm, I'm stressing out. My son is not doing well. We're trying to get him in this school. And culturally, we don't talk about these things. Right. Like we're not going to see someone out and they say, oh, you look stressed. What's going on? Oh, my child has a learning disability and I'm trying to get them in a school. But your dad right. did that. And I mean, right. we don't know who that friend was and like how influential they might have been. But the next day he got a call and you got in. Right. Right. Yep, so, yep. so networking and talking and sharing and asking questions is so important, right? Yes. It's so important because this is a very small space, right. you know, um, just learning disabilities, learning differences, special education. It's a very small space and, mm -hmm. and folks know people or they know resources that you just wouldn't find out about. So it's, it's important that you um, that you talk about it, that you share information because you never know. I mean, you know, he just was getting off the elevator. Right. Yep. Yep. So that is important to, um, you know, speak about that. And that's one thing I've always, I, I haven't been, you know, ashamed of my dyslexia or anything like that. So, you know, I kind of 
I, I talk about it like you know especially in classes and things and things like that with teachers I, I kind of let them know like hey you know I have dyslexia and that's one thing you know some people are like I, I do I have a friend he doesn't tell anyone like he he doesn't tell his friends people he's in a relationship with you know I don't it's like hey that's fine it's you know we we just learn different and it's nothing yep. to be be ashamed of did your friend go to public school or private school um he went to public school and then he went to a school for um all dyslexic a high school high one. school yeah yeah the reason why so, i asked that is because what i i noticed is that when kiddos two things when they're in an environment and they're being taught okay you have dyslexia it's okay you learn differently this is how you advocate for yourself they're taught how to self advocate right and and they'll speak up about it right. and then and then if they have a parent like your your dad he was he was like okay you just learned differently i got to get you help that makes a difference in how that adult will speak up about it you know what i mean like having that support and being told like it's okay right, right? And, and that makes a huge difference because what i would tell parents is after k12 you're on your own nobody's going to know nothing follows you forever after right. k12 nobody's going to know and right. that child's still going to have some struggles and some some things that they need more right. time right in college you have to self advocate when you get out in the workplace employers are are legally to provide a reasonable accommodations but if you don't even know and you don't speak up then how can they help you exactly. exactly yeah yeah so i just wanted to i just was asking that because what i find is that the kiddos in public schools aren't being um I mean, and I remember when I was in school, kids were tracked, right? They were tracked. And then you had those bottom in quotation marks, right? right? Or or, right. or on the other side of the building or something, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so there was that negative connotation with, with being dumped in this class. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's just the educational system was not set up to teach us. It's just like, you know, if you're a left-handed person, and somebody's always teaching you how to use your your right hand, that's not going to work, you know? So that's, it's just like, we just learn differently. And once we learn the way that we need to learn, we we got it. Like it's, it's no stopping. So. Yeah. So tell me about your college experience. What was next after you, you went to Jimacy for, what is it, middle and high school? No, I actually went to Jimacy for just middle school. They didn't have a high school in the nineties. Um, okay. So after Jemisee, I went to Calvert Hall. Oh. And, um, yeah, so Calvert Hall had a program actually called the um, Xavier program. I think it's called something different now. I think it's called the La LaSalle program now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I went to Calvert Hall and um, that was a great experience for me. I felt Jemisee prepared me well for, um, for Calvert Hall and um, got through that. I played sports. I was on the football team. And um, it was a great experience. Uh, the Xavier program helped me, you know, I, again, that was like the learning resource center from my like first and fifth grade years. Like I had that one, su one subject that I would go, one class I could go every day to the Xavier program and meet with my tutor. Her name was Miss Vaughn Meigen. I remember her and she was very nice. You know, she would help me with any, you know, if I had any struggles with any classwork and then we would just work on some, some basic things. And one thing the Xavier program also helped me with extended timing on test. Mm -hmm. so that, that was something that, you know, I, I, not, I didn't really experience that at Jemisee because you would get all the time, you know, you were in the class with all your peers and when you finished, you finished. But, you know, for the Xavier program, you went there and you took your test in that um, facility. So yeah, you weren't, yeah. You weren't mainstream taking your test with all your other peers you went to a private area to take your test so I feel like that was very helpful for me and um the one thing that after um Calvert Hall I remember was um we had multiple choice questions at Calvert Hall and small essay but when I got into college it was like essay questions like you you don't get the multiple choice you're just gonna have this whole essay. You have a one question on a whole, and I was kind of like thrown off on that. I was like, "What? I fill up this whole blue book with a answer?" You know, that was <laughs> that was the thing that I think um, you know, Cabo Hall was great, but I wasn't prepared for that essay question. Mm -hmm, those, mm -hmm. those long essay questions in college. 
So um, that's one thing I want, you know, parents and students to who are listening to this know, like, be prepared for that. Like when you go to college, you might have to um, have a longer answers for your essay question. You might, might not even be multiple choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, that's key because what Jim and C did for you was they provided the intervention, right? right. You know, how are you going to improve your reading? How are you going to improve your, your comprehension, your writing? And, mm-hmm. and your math skills, right? They provide the intervention, right? And then when you went to Calvert Hall, they provided the accommodations. And what right. parents don't realize is that they're different. The intervention is the how, right? Right? How, how, how is it different? How, how are you mm-hmm. gonna um, differentiate this instruction for this, this kiddo? Because I remember when my daughter was identified, they was like, oh, we're gonna give her more time. We're gonna let her know that we're gonna call on her first on the carpet. And I kept saying, but how is that teaching her how to read? Like right. that's not teaching her how to read because she reads differently. The way we're you're doing it is not working right now. And so the accommodations and, and she needs both, right? She she's learning how to read, but she's a slow reader. So she's gonna need that accommodation of more time. Right. And so right. it's very important that children get the interventions, you know, one through through eight. They get the interventions. And back then, Jimacy because they didn't have a high school, they knew that we've got to get these kids ready, right? We got to get them ready. We don't have a high school to keep nurturing and pouring into them. They need to be ready to transition to a traditional high school with supports, right? right? And so, so that's really key. So then when you go to college, you get the accommodations and supports. And what I learned too, we had uh, Dr. Butler on the show and I didn't even think of this. I know that when you have a, a learning difference, you can go to support center at your college. But right. then a lot of the, the academic uh, coaching or academic services, mm-hmm. they're just as good and helpful as the, the support services. They're just another layer of support, like the writing center, different things like that. So it's just very important that parents understand that there's the intervention, the what's different to get them up to snuff, to close the gap. and then. You can, you know, some kiddos do transition um, to a traditional high school that has supports, that has a program, or the parent is just more knowledgeable to really get a robust IEP or 504 plan for high school because now they've got the intervention. So that that's really, really key. So what was college like for you after you had the, the experience as far as accessing services and help you needed? Did you seek out help or did you say, you know what, I got this? Oh yeah, I, I, I do want to. I want to go back just one second to the Jimacy experience, and then I'll, I'll double back. But I wanted to let parents know, as far as as and Jimacy, I felt like they focused a lot on my reading and you know comprehension. But you know, Jimacy is a great school. And I don't know if it's, have things changed, but I felt like my math was kind of left behind because they were focusing so much more on my reading. And I didn't get, I felt like the math subjects was, were not really um, strong at, when I was there. And so I think I struggled with a little bit more of my mathematics when I got to Calvert Hall. You know, and I know that there's dys- dyslexia, but there's also a dyslexic for math. Is it called, what's it called, dyscalculus or? Yeah, dyscalculia, dyscalculia. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of reading in math, right? And right. so- those who struggle with dyslexia can struggle in math just overall, right? right. And you, you have the dyscalculia, which is the learning disability in math. And then you have dysgraphia, which is the learning disability in written expression. And so there's like the three Ds, <laughs> dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. I can tell you that the math has really um, improved and it is, is much more um, robust. And that was a topic at all of the schools. Right. Uh-huh. All of the area schools um, really increase in the math and the writing. Right. right. Because like you said, that essay question mm-hmm. um, and my daughter, um, she was at two dyslexia schools. So so mm-hmm. Jimacy is our second dyslexia school. And right. um, definitely they focus in on all three. But of course, that reading is the primary focus. And what I learned because I asked her math teacher, I said, well, how can I reinforce it and help her? Now, my daughter does not have a love of reading, but she enjoys cooking. Okay. But she enjoys sewing. Okay. Right. And sewing has a lot of math and cooking. She's got to read the recipes. That is the first time 
I really saw her like she goes to school and she's learning how to read, but to come home and say, oh, show me what you learn, read for me. No, that's not happening. My daughter looks at me sideways. Mom, I'm tired. I work really hard in school. But right. I overhear her in the kitchen trying to read the recipes, right? So she's reading the recipes and then she's doing the measurements, mm -hmm. right? So her teacher was like, just push her in everyday experiences to use those skills. So she's using math and cooking. She's using math and sewing. Oh my gosh, is she not using math and sewing? Cause she asked me questions and I'm like, wait till you go to sewing class, I can't help you. Right. <laughs> but you know, she's using those skills and the things that she likes to do. Right. And so I'm very conscious now of how can I help her, right? Mm -hmm. Like writing, she, she, it's not her favorite either. But if I say we're going grocery shop and go ahead and write the list and I'm not correcting her spelling, I'm not, you know, whatever, go ahead and write the list for us. And she's like, okay, mommy, I'll write the list. So this is like reinforcing that writing. Right. So, yeah. so I'm trying to sneak it in. <laughs> right. I'm trying to sneak it in, but I know that they have really upped the math. Okay. And she had a um, she had a wonderful math teacher last year and math tutor. And so this year she was like, oh no, mommy, I don't need a math tutor. And it was like, oh no, she's going to be fine over the summer. I'm like, right. go ahead with your bad self. Uh, but um, I oh, remember oh. when I was at the, the private school and a part of being director of admissions, you, you talk with other schools and you guys always come together about certain things and right. the math and the writing, the math and the writing, because those were the key things so that kiddos could transition, but then also be successful and get in any college they wanted to go to. Right. right. And not be pigeonholed or have to take um, remedial math and right. writing classes. So, yeah. 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 So I just, you know, I did get tutoring at Calvert Hall for my math, you know, like private tutoring. I think I remember going to a tutor. She actually taught at Friends and she, um, she, you know, would go to our house. She would teach me some tricks that were really helpful for like algebra and things like that. And it's like, wow, you know, it was, but I do remember I had a tutoring is very important. Individual tutoring. Like if you're struggling, that's, that's the one subject I feel like I struggled most in at Calvert Hall was, um, you know, my math but I did get tutoring and I was able to successfully pass the classes and sometimes, you know, do really well. So, you know, that's, that's a good point. And at the end of Calvary Hall, I ended up graduating with honors at Calvary Hall after leaving Genesee. And I, I got the honors award for the Xavier program. They chose a student out of the senior class who did the best out of the Xavier program. Wow. And that, that student was me. So I kept it a secret from, from my father that year. And, um, when he saw me come across the stage with honors, like he he couldn't hold back. He's like, OT, the guy on the in the back of me, he was uh he was patting my back because I was just I, I was he was crying. Oh so, you know, so yeah, so that was that was a um really good experience for me, you know, through Cabo Hall. And then you know, you asked a question about college. I remember one time Miss Von Mike and my Xavier teacher, she told me, she said, OT, my senior year, she told me, she said, OT, you know, college is gonna be tough for you but you're going to get through it because of your, um, you have great people skills. And at that time I was like, what does that mean? I didn't know what that mean meant as a teenager. Like, I'm just, I just heard her say college is going to be tough for me. I was like, what? Like, but I do remember her saying that the end. she's like, you're going to do okay because you have good people skills. So you asked a question about college. Um, yeah, it was, it was, a. I ended up going to a Delphi university after, um, Calvary Hall. And I chose some colleges that were um, that had a program similar to the Xavier program at at Calvary Hall. Adelphi had something like that, you know. But once I once I got there, I saw like okay, it wasn't as intense as Calvary Hall. You know, it was kind of just like a program. Hey, you need help or anything, you know? And if you said no, they they didn't really dig into like let me see what you need. You kind of like you know. And as a teenager in college, you're like, no, I'm good, you know. So. But what it really helped me with, again, was the extended time on tests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I needed that extended time when I'll tell you all about those essays. I was just like, what is this? Like, I got to write a whole, like, fill up this book with an answer to this question. So that definitely helped me in college. And, you know, it was a smaller school, Delphi University, those smaller classes. So that's one reason why. I chose it, but one of the main reasons why I chose it was because it had a program which I thought was similar to the Xavier program, and they offered me extra time. But my second year at Adelphi, I got in a really bad car accident. Um, I was pledging a fraternity, and um, my big brother at the time he got he fell asleep at the wheel, 
and um, I had a severe head trauma. And that, you know, I was mid semester. I was when that happened, and um, I had to go back to Baltimore. You know, the accident happened. I don't, I don't really even remember going back to Baltimore. Oh wow! Um, yeah, um, I, I woke up in my bed in Baltimore, kind of like. What, what, you know, I remember waking up and said, what, what happened? I went to my, my parents' room and they were like, you were, in, you were in a car accident. And I was just like, wow. And, you know, I was, when you have a head trauma, you kind of, it's either one way. I'm, I'm pretty much a relaxed guy. And, um, but, you know, I was absolutely my opposite self um, with a head trauma. But once I got to, I think, I guess my, um, the swelling went down. I came to and, and I was just thinking about like, well, what am I going to do? Well, college, I was like, what am I, I, you know, what am I going to do? Like I was mid semester and they were like, they, they, my parents were kind of just like looking at each other, like, okay, is he back? <laughs> you know, I think he's back now. So um, I ended up losing that semester my sophomore year. Um, so my parents asked me to make a decision uh, if I wanted to go back. And I really couldn't make the decision at that age. I was just like, I didn't know what I, what, what to do. And so I kind of let them make the decision for me. And they were like, okay, well, you're staying here. You're staying, you're staying in Maryland. You know, Adelphi was in Long Island, New York. So I ended up transferring to a, to a few colleges. I, I was kind of a little confused, didn't know what I wanted to do after that. You know, so I decided to um, try. I was talking to my, my, my stepmother, who's, who happens to be a psychiatrist. And she was like, she kind of sat me down on the couch at home. And I, <laughs> it was like... Um, She's like, oh, too, well, you know, you kind of, you good up with people. Maybe you might want to try, you know, physical therapy, something like that. And, you know, so I kind of ran with that. And I went to, um, I started off at UB. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't really like that, that school because it was, it was mainly for like working adults. Yep. yep. Know, at, at that, at that time, it's mm-hmm. different now. So um, I went there and I just didn't like that atmosphere and I transferred out of there and I went to UMBC to try to do this physical therapy thing. Then I got into those biology classes and I was like, oh no, this is not gonna work for me. I was like, so I had all these, you know, I had a pretty substantial amount of business credits and I actually talked to um, Mr. Harbowski who who still is the president of UMBC and he kind of looked at my um, transcript and said, man, you got a lot of business credits. Like we don't really have a business school so you might wanna, you know, look at some schools that you can use these credits. And um, so I, I did that and I ended up transferring to Towson. Go and, Tiger! <laughs> yeah, right. Ended up transferring to Towson and um, I had a a good um, counselor at, um, it was a counselor that helped you like kind of figure out what classes you needed to take. Maybe like an academic advisor. But yeah, that's what, yeah. It, that's what it is. Yep, academic advisor. And she really helped me like figure it out. You know, I really appreciate her. I remember her. She was actually, she was really passionate about her job. So if um, students want to find an advisor like that, like seek them out because they really are helpful. And she kind of like told me some teachers, hey, you, you, you need this class, you need that class. Um, you know, you might want to stay away from this teacher. You know, she knew it. She knew it all. So, um, you know, I ended up finishing at Towson with a business uh, administration degree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, what I found out was that every college has to help a student that has a learning disability. Like they have to have some sort of center that you go to for your extended time, you know, and that's really after a while, that's really all that I needed. But um, going back to Jimmy, one thing that they did, they taught me to be an advocate for myself. And I had to through that. That's when the adv- advocacy started was mainly in college. You know, I kind of mm-hmm. had to. Get to know that I made sure the teachers knew who I who I, who I was and kind of knew my struggles, and um, they work with me um, just like Miss Von Meigen was telling me. Like I guess those were the people skills that she was telling me. Like, hey, you're gonna be okay because you have that. And I I was able to you know some teachers would help me out and um, one after I explained to them like you know some of my struggles, and then you know I, I do remember one teacher who you know, you do come across those teachers that are not going to be as supportive. I I think I was in my senior year and I was taking, taking this decision science class and I was struggling and I went to talk to the teacher and the teacher, I guess he saw I was struggling. He was like, 
are you sure you want this to be your major? I was like, this is my last semester. Like, what do you, you know, like, yes, you know, like, I, I mean, that really kind of upset me. So I was just like, you know, what? I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna show him. And so I kind of, I, I saw some other students that were struggling and I got them together. I said, like, let's, let's study together. And I actually found, I went to another college. I went to UB. I went back to UB because I knew they had a good tutoring program. And I found a tutor at a different college to help me with decision science. Oh, wow. Yeah. So again, that's another thing of like advocating for yourself. You know, I left the whole, I left Towson. I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to UB, see if they got some, have some tutors there that can help me with this class. And they did. And um, that was very helpful. And I got through the class. I think I got a, I think I got a C in that class, but I remember one time somebody saying like a C will see you through. <laughs> <laughs> so it saw me through and, um, you know, college, like Ms. Von Mike said, it was a struggle for me, but you know, I got through it and um, was able to finish. That is awesome. That is an awesome story. I graduated. Uh, I got my graduate degree from Towson. I was actually telling someone. So every college that receives federal dollars, they have to, you know, provide services. And it's just a matter of what type and how robust those services are. So there are like three levels um, right. to services you can get at college. One where you would sign an agreement because you would be mm -hmm. in the program. And then the next level would be, uh, uh, less comprehensive, but they would have someone who's certified or who, who understands learning disabilities. And then that third level is almost like the bare minimum. Like the government says, we have to provide reasonable accommodations. You come in here, we're going to give you the, the, the bare minimum, right? So there's different levels to it. But I remember being at Towson and having a project and it was three of us on the team. And at the last hour, these two kids said, oh, well, I have a learning disability. I can't write. Like they couldn't write. And I was going, I was going on vacation. I think I was going to Vegas. So I remember being on a plane, right in their section, in my section. I'm right. like, this is a setup. <laughs> how both of them, I'm like, how both of them talk about they have a learning disability. This is a setup. But then, you know, the part that made me upset was it didn't seem like they even read over what I wrote when we had to present. That annoyed me more than anything. Right. Like, come on, y'all didn't even look over it. And yeah. now in hindsight, thinking about it, Y'all going to leave it up to the ADHD girl who have anxiety around deadlines, right? And, and <laughs> have no concept of time and who's always late on things, <laughs> you know, but um, I do remember that. But the key thing that you, you said here was self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want people to really hear and understand that self-advocacy, because at college and beyond, you have to advocate for yourself and you've got to kind of navigate and figure out like you went to UB, you like, you know what? I didn't really like that school, but they had some things there that, that were on the up and up. Let me go back and find me a tutor. Right. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. now you are the president of OT Moore Management, which is a black owned business right. and you are running things. Yep. Yep. It's Otis Moore Management. It's a third generation business. Uh, my grandfather started the business. My grandfather was um, basically a landlord in Baltimore and um, provided housing for people on the west side of Baltimore. And um, after my grandfather lost his, was losing his sight, uh, my father came in to help him and he really expanded the business and um, became a real estate broker, a property management company and a developer. So, um, so yeah, now I'm um, in that third generation keeping the business going. Um, we're a successful management company. And um, I'm proud to say that we're one of the top rated management companies based on our size in the country. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with apartment ratings, but um, a community that I manage, uh, Dickey Hill Forest Apartments, is one of the top rated communities in, um, in Baltimore City. So yeah, so you know, I've, I'm a licensed real estate broker, and I'm also a certified property manager. Oh, so the learning never stopped, right? The test taking never stopped. <laughs> test taking never stopped. Yep, yep. And the tutoring never stopped. Sometimes you, you find uh, for my, my certified property management course, I had a um, great tutor, a, a gentleman that I told him at a, at a um, well, it was, I think it was at a conference. I said, hey, man, I want to get my CPM. And, you know, I, sometimes I was like, I told him straight, I was like, look, man, I'm dyslexic and I uh, my struggle with some of these classes and he, he gave me his information. He said, call me when you're ready. And um, 
he was able to get a group of us together and he kind of like met with us on Zoom and everything. And he really helped show us some tricks on how to how to navigate through that CPM exam. So um, it's, it's always about advocacy. And I think, you know, honestly, I, I think he told me he had a son that went to Gemacy. So oh, I think wow. that, that it struck him like, hey, that's why I was like up front that he's like, you know what, just call me. And um, he was able to, to help me out and give me some really good tips on that exam. So, yeah, it really it really never stops advocating for yourself and um, just trying to find those things that work for you. Oh, my gosh. OT, that is that is so awesome. Well, there you have it. I really wanted OT to just share his journey, you know, share his story from, you know, the beginning to where he is now, because like I said, he was one of the first people that I spoke with that pointed me in the right direction to to get help for my daughter. And and I can't uh, thank him enough and and appreciate it. But what I really want you guys to hear and what resonated throughout his story was self-advocacy and was talking to people and speaking up. His dad did it on the elevator with the, the young lady you know, OT did it in, in high school when he was in the program and then in college. And now out here, he's the president of a very successful black owned business. And he wasn't shy about saying, look, I'm going to take this exam, but hey, you know, I'm struggling. And the guy, I'm like, wait a minute. And there's that familiarity. The guy is like, wait a minute. I know about Jimacy. I know about dyslexia because my kiddo has it. Right. So we've got to be able to talk and be comfortable sharing information because there's nothing wrong with learning different. And that's just really what I want to drive home. There's nothing wrong with learning different. Your kid learns different. You learn different. So what? Right? So what? I mean, you're still great. So, you know, guys, I just really wanted to drive that home. Self-advocacy, networking, talking, sharing your story. Tune in next week where we'll continue to bring you lived experiences and more unfiltered conversations with experts in the field around all things Black and dyslexic. Make sure you subscribe and follow the Black and Dyslexic podcast, where we educate, empower, and equip Black and underrepresented minorities. The Black and Dyslexic podcast is partially funded by Morgan Cares and the Center for Urban Health Disparities Research and Innovation, awarded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Black and Dyslexic podcast is sponsored by Dyslexia Advocation Incorporated, a 501c3 charitable organization located in Baltimore City, Maryland, whose mission is to equip parents of children with dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities with the necessary tools to help their children become successful readers. You can find them on the web at www.soallcanread.org.